The Lord's my shepherd, I've got one. He makes me lie in pastures green. He leads me by the still, still waters. His goodness restores my soul. I will trust in you alone. I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. He guides my ways in righteousness and he anoints my head with oil and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his pure delight and I will trust in you I will trust in you alone, for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me home. And though I walk the darkest path, I will not fear the evil one for you are with me and your rod and staff are the comfort I need to know and I will trust in you alone I will trust in you alone for your endless mercy follows me, your goodness will lead me home, and I will trust in you alone. I will trust in you alone, for your endless mercy follows your goodness will lead me home. Good evening, Larry Miller and friends. Uh, welcome to our home. Uh, we hope we're all keeping safe and well at this time. The plan was that Ian was going to interview us tonight in church, but obviously that can't happen. So the pastor's asked us to record something and share it online with you, some of our story. Uh, I'm glad this is in week one of staying at home. Otherwise, if it was week five or six, I might have a ponytail and maybe even a beard like the pastor's. Um, but that's not just that stage yet. Uh, so for those of you who don't know us, uh, I'm Kai. I'm married to Pamela. We have two children, Joshua and Abigail. Uh, and I'm a software consultant. And I'm Pamela and I work for Elam International Missions as a PA to the Irish Missions Director and look after the finance. So just to set the scene a little for you tonight, um, we are just a very lonely family who believe that Jesus is our saviour, our healer, our baptiser and our coming king. And as a family we love to worship and to serve the Lord in whatever way we can, but I guess our favourite way to express our worship is through music and song. Growing up, our parents instilled many great values in us as to how to do life, but most importantly, they taught us how to rely on God for everything. One of the most important things my parents passed on to me was the need to rely on God's word in every detail and decision in life, and to seek confirmation of his word, and to worship him in every season, no matter how pressing the circumstances. 
Tonight we will share some of our story and how God has used his word, intertwined with worship, to direct and guide us, bring comfort and healing, and show how he has demonstrated to us so many times that his promises are true, that his word can be totally and utterly depended upon, and that he is faithful. And we just hope that what we share encourages you. <clears throat> You know, each year um, my granny Donaghy used to give me a birthday card and there was a verse on it. Um, and one of the ones that stood out for me was when I was in teenage years, um, it was 2 Timothy chapter 3 and it said, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and be assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I was brought up in a, in a loving Christian home. Uh, my uh, dad was a very involved in church and so was my mother. Dad was a treasurer and my mum was Sunday school teacher named Sunday school superintendent. We went to a small church in Belfast, relatively small, but there was very few people my age uh, around that teenage years. Uh, and I thought I was sort of on my own. But one year we went to uh, Elam Conference in Bognoritis and suddenly there was these masses of young people there trying to live the Christian life, trying to live their life for Jesus. And I realised that I wasn't on my own there. A few other young people then came to our church then after that, um, including a stunning young lady. Um, so that was Pamela. I can say that because it was Pamela. My time is up. And her family came and actually her dad came to be the pastor of the church at this time. Pam and I started going out together then we started getting involved in the youth club, youth fellowship, um, when we were around sort of 18. Uh, and then we started to get involved in the worship in the church and life went on. We started to then plan for, um, you know, getting engaged and getting married, but the job that I was in really didn't help us in that situation. There wasn't very much money coming into the house. So we applied for other jobs and I can remember uh, distinctly praying over an application form uh, that we put into a particular job. We went for the I went for the interview for that job and I came a friend, he chatted away with me and then he said, come on, we need to go for the interview now. He was actually interviewing me, which put me at ease. Uh, then the miracle of that was there was actually two jobs, a trainee and a senior role, which I didn't really fit in either. But what happened was that they interviewed me and then offered me a position and, and made that position in the middle that I could um, that I could work with. And so we started to save then uh, and started to put preparations for uh, getting a home. Skip on a few years and Joshua, whenever he was born, um, you know, we started to watch him walking around and we found that he was walking on his tiptoes. Uh, and we were not expecting this, he wouldn't put his foot down flat, so we went and got him checked out. And we were told that actually Joshua had a problem with his Achilles tendon, and he would never walk or even run um, the way he should have, and he could have been faced with an operation. With the persistence that he, and loving mother, uh, who did all the daily exercises and uh, strengthening him, uh, and also to an answer to prayer, which is a real answer to prayer. God uh, really answered there, and Joshua was completely fine. We've proved over and over again how God is interested in every detail of our lives. When Abigail was leaving primary school and she was doing a transfer test, um, there was only really one school that she had on her heart. Really, so her heart set on just one particular school, Really, unfortunately uh, and unexpectedly, Abigail didn't get and didn't achieve the results that her teachers and, and we expected her to. This meant that that school really wasn't a viable option any longer. After much prayer and seeking God, uh, we were led to the two Bible verses. One in Psalms that said, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And we knew that the desires of Abigail's heart uh, um, was for this school. And that God's hand was on her as she delighted in him. In faith then, trusting God um, for Abigail's future, we completed an application for him for the school anyway. Relying on God's word that we'd read. And also in Psalm 138 where it said, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. 
You know, at that time there was a song that came out as well called Good, Good Father. And one of the lines from that song says, you are perfect in all of your ways. So we sang that song and we believed in what we read in God's word. Miraculous help again was accepted, once again proving God's faithfulness in that situation. You know, in my Christian life, God has always been faithful. It's not meant that everything has gone smoothly. It's not meant that the garden has always been rosy. In the Christian walks, there's many bumps along the road. Um, and some, even some of the worst pains that we can have have came from friends and, uh, and those close to us. But we've learned that even in all of the storms around us, that God is in the midst. Nahum says in chapter 1, verse 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. Well, I was brought up also in a Christian home, a very busy Christian home, where every night of the week basically was taken up with some sort of Christian service. Dad was a lay preacher, um, Sunday school superintendent, campaigners, involved in Teen Challenge, Mum looked after girl guides. They were both great prayer warriors and I know that their prayers sustained us um, throughout our, our childhood and teenage years and moving into adulthood. My grandfather was the pastor of the church that we attended on the Crumlin Road in Belfast, right beside Crumlin Road Jail. We went to church in the height of the troubles there under surveillance camera and sometimes escorted by soldiers. Um, this was a congregation of people of great faith and very dependent on God. In 1982, Dad was made redundant from BP Oil Refinery and God opened the door for him to serve in, as a full-time pastor. Um, we, he was called to Randall's time, so as a family of six, we arrived in Randall's time to four godly retired ladies. They, of course, were delighted to see us and felt like it was revival as the congregation more than doubled merely upon our arrival. I wasn't so sure about how I felt about it all. Um, we served the Lord as a family, but there weren't many young people and I had to move school in a school that I was very happy in in third form and this was difficult. There were times that I wanted to rebel and I resented where God had brought us having to leave family and friends behind. I saw the financial strain on my parents as often there just wasn't enough offering to pay dad's salary. Mum worked full time, but God met our need over and over again and the oil never ran out. God remained faithful and held me and our family firmly in his grip of grace. I mentioned difficult days in 2011 uh, we basically find ourselves in a place of pain and what I would describe as that we felt that we were in ruins. The details are not necessary but suffice to say that we had been terribly hurt and were left in a state of brokenness, questioning, gifting, ministry, calling but we continue to hold on to God's word. We went through a period of time where we didn't lead worship for about 18 months as we tried to recover and allow God to minister and heal us. But that didn't mean we weren't still worshipping the audience of one at home as we refocused and we healed. During this time, the Lord led us to Lurgan Elam. And with the verse in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 33, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, and that he shall rebuild old ruins, they shall raise up former desolations, and they shall repair ruined cities. At this time, we went to um, a Tim Hughes' concert. Tim had come over from Worship Central. During that concert, he displayed on the screen a picture of ruins, and they were the ruins during the wartime in Sarajevo. And in the middle of these ruins, there was a cellist dressed in his full concert attire, playing his cello, and his music was resounding for all to hear amongst the ruins, the ruins and chaos. And I remember Tim Hughes using this illustration and referring to Isaiah, saying, Put on your garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness and worship in the ruins. So we continue to do that. During that time, Hill Songs had released a song called Glorious Ruins. The words of it go like this. When the world caves in, still my hope will cling to your promise. When my courage ends, let my heart find strength in your presence. I'll walk through the fire with my head lifted high 
and my spirit revived in your story. And I look to the cross as my failure is lost in the light of your glorious grace. So let the ruins come to life in the beauty of your name. Rising up from the ashes, God, forever you reign. And my soul will find refuge in the shadow of your wings. And I will worship forever, forever I will sing. In 2016, we started to see some answers to prayer within our immediate family and wider family circle. Abigail had got into school. We all started to open doors for us as a family. I started to work um, for the Irish Missions Director as the lady there was retiring to finance. And I found myself um, having to travel to Melbourne to the Edens International Centre for the first time for a staff meeting there. And that first day we went to student devotions. And the first song that they sang in the devotions was Glorious Ruins. Um, at that point, I bowled my eyes out as usual, but I knew that God was absolutely where he wanted me. God had me absolutely where he wanted me to <coughs> be, and the ruins were starting to be rebuilt. It felt like God was beginning to join the dots, fulfilling his promises to us, and we could trace his hand. Later in 2016, as I was prepping to lead worship in church and seeking the Lord for his word and how to lead, um, the Lord brought Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 and 4 to my attention. And it says, The whole tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no room, nor death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Little did I know that this verse that God had given me was preparing me for the events that would follow in that incoming week. <clears throat> On the 12th of October 2016, on a very normal Wednesday when I was busy at work, Kyle arrived unexpectedly with the devastating news that Mum and Dad, who were on holiday in Spain and due to come home that day, unfortunately Mum had received her home call to glory and had taken a brain hemorrhage. I remember every detail of that day. It was a sunny but very cold autumn day. But I was also reminded of the words that God had given me at the previous weekend. God's word shielded me, so when the shock happened in my sorrow and pain, I knew that God was reminding me that this had not been a shock to him, and that I could grieve with hope, and that one day there would be a great family reunion where neither death nor sorrow nor pain would part us, and we would worship together with the billions that had gone before from every tribe and tongue and nation. Of course there were dark days, there are days that I thought I would break as the grief and sense of loss was overwhelming. But I knew that I had so much to be thankful for and that my grief was the price of knowing great love. I still miss mum, I miss her every day. I long for a conversation to share and celebrate with her the joys of family and for her godly wisdom and prayers when we face trials and difficulties. But it has meant that I've had to lean in closer and rely more on my heavenly father and his word. He drew close as his word says, he was near to me the brokenhearted, and he was near to me the one who was crushed in spirit. It's given me a perspective and a longing for heaven. Once again at this time, the Lord <clears throat> linked his word to worship for us. Matt Redman released a song um, based on the old hymn called One Day. We listened to it often as a family with tears, knowing that God held us comforting us and once again was binding our word, his word to our hearts with songs of worship. The words go like this. One day you'll make everything new, Jesus. One day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away. No more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all, Jesus. One day every question resolved. Every anxious thought left behind. No more fear. And then it goes into the old hymn when we all get to heaven. Sometimes things don't work out how we've planned or how we've thought they should. And I honestly thought as a family we would have been raptured together. But God in his perfect plan and will had a different plan. Working things out for his glory and for our good. At that time I read these beautiful words during that season that said, God in his fullness is the great composer of our souls, moving us in and out of seasons giving and taking away, using both space and melody. He composes our lives into a symphony far more dynamic 
and beautiful than we could ever have written for ourselves. In conclusion, uh, we'd like to encourage you. We'd like to encourage you that at this time of uncertainty, that we can look back and you can look back with us and see how God's hand has been uh, on our lives, and how he has been faithful to us in the good times and in the bad. You can know like we did, uh, his comfort, his direction, his strengthening, uh, through his word and through the blessing of his presence as we worshipped God and as we seek to glorify his name. Your honest, sincere worship matters to God. So in this season, when we don't really know what's around the corner, you can cling to God's word. You can find your unique song uh, as you worship with your life. The Passion Translation says in finishing in Luke 11 verse 2, May the glory of your name be the centre on which our lives turn. God bless. God bless. Thank you, Kyle and Pamela, for those amazing words, such encouraging words about how God is faithful to us, uh, faithful in every situation, how encouraging it is to know, particularly in this day and age, that we serve a faithful God. Thanks for staying with us tonight. I'm going to close our evening service just by bringing a few simple thoughts from God's word. Now, I know I have no flowery wallpaper behind me, but hopefully you'll stay with me as we see what God wants to say, say to us tonight. I'm going to read from my Bible. I'm going to read th three verses from John chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, you can read along. If not, you can just listen to the words. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees, a religious leader, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then again, I just want to highlight verse 7. Jesus says again to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And I'm sure those famous words you've heard maybe a few times throughout your life. But we're just going to spend a wee bit of time unpacking how Jesus said them, why Jesus said them, and what they mean, not just to Nicodemus, but what they mean to us in the 21st century. We know that God will add a blessing to the public reading of his word. As we look at this story of Nicodemus and, and Nicodemus coming to see Jesus, we understand that Nicodemus would have been um, well, he would have been a religious man. He would have been very upstanding. A lot of people would have known Nicodemus as a good man. He comes across really well, not just in the Bible, but the very fact that he's a Pharisee. Most people would have recognised him as a holy man, a religious man, a good man. And here we see him coming to Jesus, maybe for a conversation, more, for, maybe for a discussion. It's not quite clear why exactly Nicodemus came to Jesus. Maybe he wanted a few answers to see who Jesus was. But what we do know about Nicodemus is that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night time. Now, this is really interesting. It's not just like an evening visit, not just popping around at night, but the fact that he came at night tells us that Nicodemus didn't want to be seen by anybody else visiting or talking to Jesus. He wanted to do this on the sly, if you like. He wanted to do this a bit in the secret. Yes, he wanted to hear what Jesus had to say, but he didn't want everybody knowing that he was going to hear and speak to Jesus. And I just wonder tonight, I don't know this is going on out, out across Facebook and, and probably maybe watched later on by other people. I, I wonder if there's somebody out there and, and you would never really come to church. You would never enter a church building. Uh, and maybe that's from pride. Maybe you don't want people to see that you would do that. Maybe you're just sick and tired. But for whatever reason, you've maybe stumbled across or deliberately come on to uh, watch this video tonight but we know that there are no accidents with God uh, and we know that God doesn't make mistakes and so what I'd encourage you that if you are listening to this video tonight and you know that, that you would never really go to church or you would never really want for people to know that you are listening 
to what God had to say. This is what Nicodemus was like. Nicodemus came, but he didn't want everybody to see him coming. He wanted to hear what Jesus said. And so it's into that context that Jesus speaks. And, and Nicodemus starts off with a pretty, almost flattering question. He says this to Jesus, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now that seems pretty nice. That seems like a nice wee introduction. Uh, you know, God's with you. You're doing all these amazing things. But Jesus kind of cuts across that. Uh, and it's the same for people maybe that are here, don't want anybody to see. And Jesus is saying, listen, there's something really, really important. Your pride's not important. Your, your reputation's not important. Because it says that Jesus answered him. Notice Nicodemus didn't ask a question, but Jesus has come with an answer. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so Nick, Jesus answers Nicodemus with truth. This is what he said. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then again, we saw in verse seven that you must be born again. I'm sure that many people have heard or seen this phrase, in, even in the world that we live in today, you must be born again. But I wonder if you've ever, ever really stopped to think about what Jesus is really saying by that phrase and indeed the implications of what that means. You must be born again. Think about that. That we have to be made all over again. That in a way we have to start uh, again. That Jesus is, is basically saying to Nicodemus, you're not who you're meant to be or you're not what you should be. Uh, and don't get me wrong, it's not that God made us or made you by mistake. He definitely did it, didn't. It's not like that God had an off day when he made you and is saying, well, you better start all over again. But what Jesus is saying is that who we become without God is not who we're meant to be. And I think all of us deep down, if we admit it or not, honestly know that actually we're not who we're meant to be. That there's that longing within us, that there's that desire, that knowledge that, that we are made for more. And the reason that we feel this, the reason that we experience is that because even though God deliberately and intentionally made us, each and every single one of us, as we are born into this world, naturally born, we are all tainted, we are all tinged, we are all corrupted by sin. It takes away who we should be, it takes away who we're meant to be, it takes away our very identity. It makes us a slave to sin. Uh, and, and the world that we live in, this fallen world, it takes away who God intended us to be. And so Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I know that you're coming with questions. I know maybe you're trying to get a few things and work a few things out. But the reality is the most important thing as we cut across all this is that you must be born again. That's the really important thing because sin has tainted us. Sin has damaged us. And also sin changes our destination because of sin in our life. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That sin will take us to where we're not meant to go. Sin will take us to a place called hell, which the Bible says was prepared for the devil and his angels. And Jesus says, in the light of you not being who you're meant to be and ending up where you're not meant to go, you must, Nicodemus, be born again. And I believe that Jesus is speaking to each and every single person listening tonight who hasn't had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, that you must be born again. And you might wonder, in the light of that, in the light of Jesus telling us that we must be born again, well then maybe God really doesn't like me very much. God must, mustn't think very much of me if he's saying that I need to be made all over again, that I need to start from the beginning, that I need to be born again. You know, God must have a very low view of who I am. But in fact, as we go on through John chapter 3, we discover that the opposite of true is true. Very famous verse from the Bible, John 3 and 16. Jesus, still speaking to Nicodemus, says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus says to Nicodemus, it's not that I don't like you, it's not that um, I don't think very much of you, it's not that I don't value you, but actually I love you. And more than that, not just you Nicodemus, God loved 
the whole world. God loves you tonight. So much so, so that you could be born again. He sent his very own son. He sent Jesus to save your soul. And we've heard already tonight, haven't we, from Pamela, we've heard from Kyle about how they had that own personal experience of coming to know Jesus as their own saviour. And that is so important, that's so vital, that it cuts across absolutely everything, everything else, that you must be born again. God loves you and he wants you to experience that new birth, to be born all over again. Because when we are born again, we are set free. We are made who we were meant to be. We enjoy life. Jesus says in John chapter 10 that the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. And that's in the old life. But when we're born again, the Son of Man, Son of God, came that you might have life and life more abundantly. That as we're born again, we experience new life. And how does that work? Nicodemus asked that question. Can I go into my mother's room again? What, how on earth can you ever be born again? And of course, we know Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, that Jesus made a way so that we could be born again. That when he came to this earth, like God sent him to do, he died upon a cross, taking on himself all the wrong things that we had done, all the sin that we had committed, all, all, all the, the, the things that make us who we're not meant to be. He bore that on himself, carried it to a cross, died to take away the sin of the world. So that me and you, so that the whole world could experience that new birth. Let me just finish again in John 3 verse 7. You must be born again. There's an urgency about that, isn't there? It's not just when you have time to be born again. Or when you feel like it, you know, if, if, if things are going alright, you know, think about being born again. Jesus said you must be born again. You must. We're getting lots and lots of different vital information that we should follow that we should listen to in this day and age we're getting told to stay at home to only go for one weekly shop we're getting told all these different things and it's it's important it's it's valuable it's vital we should listen to it. but i would really challenge you tonight the most important thing the most important thing and the most important message that you can listen to tonight is that of jesus and the urgency of it you must be born again Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So today, make that decision to follow Jesus Christ. None of us know exactly what the future holds. None of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month. We've learned over the past few weeks, if we didn't know this already, that those things are outside of our control. But what we can control, what we can decide is where we spend eternity. Jesus asks this question again. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Or what should it profit someone if they gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So don't guarantee, don't bank on the future next week, next tomorrow, whatever it may be. But make your decision that my trust is going to be placed in Jesus Christ. That I'm going to follow him. That I'm going to experience that new life by being born again. If that's you tonight and you would like to follow Jesus Christ. I'd really encourage you right now. Even just where you are. Why not say a simple prayer. Ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Thank him for going to the cross. Ask him to, to give you that new life that is found in following him. And believe him for your salvation. Because today is the day of salvation. And in praying that prayer in faith, we believe the Bible clearly teaches that you will be born again by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. We're thanking God for his word tonight. We thank God for the testimonies that we've heard already. We pray over all the church and all the people listening to us, your friends, your family, that God will keep you safe this week. That God will bless you. Thank you for joining in with us on the Lurgan Elam Facebook page today. Don't forget that each day there's going to be devotions. There's the Bible study on Tuesday night. Why not stay connected with all that's going on here at church? But remember that really important message. That you must be born again. You must place your faith. faith you must place your faith in Jesus Christ. God bless you tonight. And God keep you safe.
Are you hurt and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of your sin? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The fire. Tell the world. 